We do not expect harmful levels of radiation to reach the West Coast, Hawaii, Alaska, or U.S. territories in the Pacific. Furthermore, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and public health experts do not recommend that people in the United States take precautionary measures beyond staying informed. George Monbiot says he now supports nuclear power. To explain why, he joins us now from Oxford. But the extraordinary fact is that no one has yet received what is believed by scientists to be a lethal dose of radiation. There, there's a growing body of evidence that uh, radiation in excess of what the government uh, says is, are the minimum amount, amounts right. you should be exposed to are actually good for you and reduce cases of cancer. <laughs> It seems that nearly a million people have already died as a result of Chernobyl, despite what WHO says and the IAEA. This is one of the most monstrous covers up, cover ups in the history of medicine, because everybody should know about this. Then we extrapolate through to Japan. Um, Japan is, by orders of magnitude, many times worse than Chernobyl. Never in my life did I think that six nuclear reactors would be at risk. Do they have control of the situation at the site? No. It's still a ticking time bomb. Americans think this crisis is over, or that some even think that maybe it's solved or it's contained. It's, it's not. We're, what's happening right now? In the last two weeks, everything we knew about that accident has been turned upside down. We were told three partial meltdowns, don't worry about it. Now we know it was 100% core melt in all three reactors. Radiation, minimal, that was released. Now we know it was comparable to the radiation at Chernobyl. And as far as evacuation, yeah, 12 miles, that's it. You don't have to evacuate beyond 12 miles. Now they find hot spots. But in New York City, you can actually see it in the milk. You can actually see that iodine-131 actually spiked a little bit in our milk in New York City. What's happening now, as I'm told, is that the Japanese government are trucking radioactive material from the Fukushima disaster area, where it's contaminated, all over Japan. Now, what possible reason could there be for burning it as far away as that? I'll tell you the reason. It's really quite sinister and horrifying. The reason is this that eventually when these children start to die from leukemia, from other cancers, from heart disease, from whatever, their parents are going to want to go into court. They're going to want to sue the Japanese government and they're going to want to have to say these, in order to do that, these children were contaminated and that's why they've got high levels of cancer. But of course, the only way that they can say that they've got high levels of cancer is to have a control group in an area that's not contaminated for example, the south of Japan. Speaking of Barack Obama and his uh, policies towards America and, and zombies, is um, his biggest uh, campaign contributions come from Exelon, a nuclear energy firm, and there are serious questions about why America is not warning its citizens about the nuclear fallout happening along the upper uh, northwest coast. Yeah, the northwest coast citizens are getting uh, fried. Well, they have called hot particles, which are radioactive little particles of cesium and uh, strontium and plutonium going, falling into their lungs. They're turning these citizens into hot pockets. <laughs> Did you have one of those things? You put them in a the microwave? He, he, Obama's microwaving his own people. Well, that radiation circled the globe and it came all the way here to Pennsylvania. And about a month after that disaster, radiation levels spiked in our water. Mangano is the executive director of the Radiation and Public Health Project, made up of scientists and health professionals. The great majority of infants who die, die in the first couple of weeks of life. And yes, you heard him right. He believes radiation traveling from Japan to the U.S. by air we breathe, getting into the rain and our food, enters our bodies. And in this case, Mangano says it's affecting particularly pregnant women without them knowing until their newborn suddenly dies. 
it goes through the placenta and into the into the fetus. And we know this this is not a, a new, something new. We but when you're in hot particles, unless there are many, 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 it's very difficult to detect a single hot particle. But that doesn't mean it's not dangerous. We're discovering by scientists, independent scientists, using air filters in Japan, that the average person in Tokyo breathed in about 10 of these hot particles every day all the way through the month of April. Those same scientists using air filters are discovering that in Fukushima, people were probably breathing in 30 or 40 times more radiation than they were in Tokyo. <clears throat> Again, in the form of a hot particle. And what surprised me was that air filters in, um, in Seattle indicate that people there were absorbing five hot particles every day for the month of April. Now, you can't run a Geiger counter over someone's lung on the outside to determine if they have a hot particle because those particles, those rays, don't travel outside the body. They do their damage to the local tissue. But we know they're there because the air filter results indicate that they are. We'll start seeing lung cancer and leukemia, I think two to five years from now. And then solid cancers will start appearing um, 15 to 60, 70 years later. So the ace up the sleeve is of the nuclear industry is the incubation time for cancer. It takes a long time for cancers to develop once you have inhaled or been exposed to these radioactive elements. And no cancer identifies its origin. And so there is already a level of cancer in society, but it's going to increase dramatically. <laughs>
2011, have spawned. The terrible child of the great Tohoku earthquake and tsunami is a gargantuan and relentless menace that has the potential to claim victims and casualties, not in the mere thousands as the tsunami did. This new menace could be spoken of in millions, if not tens of millions of deaths and casualties in this generation and generations to come. Remarkably, what is accompanying this disaster is an incredible lack of interest from heads of government, the media, and the United Nations. In swamping and overwhelming the defenses of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear facility, owned by Tokyo Electric Power Company, the tsunami gave rise to the much greater and more permanent monstrous spectre of global nuclear contamination. Radiation from Fukushima is still spewing from its reactors, with some potentially even more horrifying twists in the plot to come. Radioactive contamination cannot be readily understood or dealt with in terms easily grasped by the man on the street. It does not alarm our primal survival instincts that normally alert us to danger. Radiation cannot be seen. Radiation cannot be felt or touched. It has no taste, no scent, and no odor. It does not announce itself like an earthquake, or a marauding invader, or an enraged supernatural monster. But once released, radiation can move seamlessly and soundlessly through walls, tarps, and defensive barriers. It seeps into soil and water tables. It is an eager traveler, contemptuous of sovereign boundaries, oceans, and continents. By taking to the wind, hitchhiking on far-flung pollen grains, or falling with precipitation. Rather than taking on a terrifying tsunami-like physical force, destroying all in its path until it is exhausted of energy, radiation is an indefatigable and deadly ghost, seemingly absent and invisible, yet omnipresent and irresistible. Once released, its lethality has, in human lifespan terms, a permanent quality, as plutonium has a half-life of 24,100 years. In high doses, radiation can kill and maim in hours. Dispersed, it can patiently lodge itself in a plant, animal or human host, giving rise to a whole range of death-dealing ailments. If it does not strike dead the original host, it can easily kill or maim the offspring if, if, a, if a fetus, a normal, genetically chromosomally normal fetus, um, is exposed to a tiny bit of plutonium that lodges in its brain, developing brain, it can kill a cell that's going to form the right half of the brain or the left arm. That's called teratogenesis, damage of a normal fetus. It also, plutonium in particular, which is highly mutagenic, lodges in the testicles. It has a predilection for testicles and it lodges next to the spermatogonia, the cells that form the sperm, the precursors. And it's an alpha emitter, highly mutagenic, so it can mutate genes in the sperm to induce genetic mutations and genetic disease down the generations. And it takes up to 20 generations for recessive mutations to express themselves. So we're talking about eons of time for expression of genetic disease. That's the second thing. The third thing is if the man's got plutonium in his testicles and every male in the northern hemisphere has a tiny load in his gonads from weapons testing days and plutonium is still falling out. And the man's cremated. The smoke goes out the chimney with the plutonium so you can breathe it in. Another man can. And it's ad infinitum because plutonium has a half-life of 24,400 years and lasts for a long time. But the other thing is that the body thinks plutonium is iron. It's an iron analogue. So it's stored in the liver where it causes liver cancer. It's stored in the bone marrow to pour, cause um, to produce hemoglobin in the red blood cells, but it causes leukemia or, or bone cancer. It uh, crosses the placenta into the developing embryo, which lets nothing through it, incidentally, except plutonium and a few other nasties. It, it got, it's stored in the uh, testicle too. So it's a ubiquitous 